world of ritualistic child abuse. The witch They would sacrifice animals. Does it make you want to hate murder, or does it make you want to do murder? Let's explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. Welcome back to Rogue Darkness, the podcast that uncovers how the misinterpretations and misinformation surrounding witchcraft, the occult, and other beliefs have led many to do unthinkable crimes. From ritualistic killings and the demons that live in all of us, to exploration of the macabre and delving deep into the unknown, let's explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. I'm your host of The Grim and Gruesome, Raven. Let's go rogue and get right into today's chilling crime— the case of Tracy Wigginton and how she brutally stabbed an innocent man, reportedly, to drink his blood. Let's delve in to the notorious case of the lesbian vampire killing. Let's start off from the very beginning. Born in 1965 in the northern Australian city of Rockhampton, Tracy Wigginton was reportedly adopted by her maternal grandparents, George and Avril Wigginton, when she was just three years old. Not much is known about her parents or why she was adopted by her grandparents, but her grandparents were not the best father and mother figures in the young child's life, that's for sure. It was reported that Tracy's grandfather had sexually abused her for several years, while her grandmother was physically violent towards her, reportedly punishing Tracy for even the smallest of things, oftentimes by whipping her with the cord of an iron. Tracy has claimed that her grandparents were heavily into the occult and that their involvement in it only made her life that much more challenging while she lived with them. Her grandparents were extremely wealthy and well-known within the area that they lived, with her grandfather George being a self-made millionaire due to a profitable earth-moving business that brought in mass amounts of government contracts. The Wigginton's were notably one of Rockhampton's most powerful and influential families at that time, if only people knew what had occurred behind their closed doors. As years passed and the abuse continued, while in her teens, Tracy had attended a prestigious private all-girls school. Being open about her sexual interest in other women, Tracy made it known what she desired and was ultimately expelled from the school for reportedly molesting other girls. After her expulsion, she was then sent to a Catholic convent school where she reportedly only lasted a few years. Tracy has claimed that she had many times killed small animals growing up, and then she would proceed to drink their blood, viewing herself as a real-life vampire. She's claimed that she has always had an immense desire to one day move up in the food chain and kill a man and to drink his blood, a feeling of complete control over her victim. Fast-forwarding a few years to the year of 1989, Tracy was now 24 years old, and her evil, macabre desires hadn't gone away. According to an article from the Daily Telegraph Australia, on the night of October 21st, 1989, Tracy Wigginton, Lisa Pachinski, who was also Tracy's lover at the time, who was aged 24, Kim Jervis, and Tracy Waugh, both aged 23, spent the evening drinking at a bar called Leah Moore in Fortitude Alley, Brisbane. It was at this time that Tracy reportedly persuaded the others to help her find a person to kill so she could drink their blood. Tracy's friends were said to be quite impressionable and knew of her desire for blood, and even were said to believe that she was in fact a vampire, so they had agreed to help her find her victim. After the group was done drinking for the night, they left the bar, but their festivities did not end there. They hopped into Tracy's car around 11.30 p.m. and began driving around the inner city streets of Brisbane, searching for what they called fresh blood. While on their prowl, a man by the name of Edward Balduck was just leaving the Caledonian Club in Kangaroo Point and was standing by the curb waiting for a taxi to take him back home after a night of heavy drinking with his friends. The group spotted their potential victim and decided to pull up next to him to see where it would take them. Kim Jervis reportedly pretended to be a prostitute in an attempt to lure him to the car. When that worked, they then offered Edward a ride and he quickly accepted, since he was, one, very drunk, and two, it was a car full of young women who gave him the impression that he might get laid. The false pretenses were the group's way of luring him into their clutches to hopefully make Tracy's dreams of murder and sustenance from human blood 
come true. With Edward now in the car, Tracy drove to Orle Park and asked Edward to follow her outside. He agreed, again being heavily drunk and not fully aware of the danger he was really in. With the other women remaining in the car, Tracy walked with Edward to the banks of the Brisbane River. She then stepped away for a moment to go back to the car and have her lover, Lisa, to join her by the bank. Viewed as an act of intimacy on Tracy's end, perhaps? We may never know. A drunken Edward slouched over by the bank and he began to undress, waiting for his new acquaintance to return in hopes of getting lucky. When Tracy and Lisa returned, Tracy stood behind Edward and when he asked her what she was doing, she then reportedly took out a large hunting knife and immediately began attacking him. Upon seeing the violent ambush take place, Lisa quickly ran back to the car while Tracy continuously stabbed an almost defenseless and very unsuspecting Edward. It was reported that in total, Tracy had inflicted 27 stab wounds all over Edward's face and neck. By the time the stabbing was over, Edward had reportedly almost been decapitated from the brutality and severity of the slashes. With blood gushing from his gashed neck and face, Tracy then proceeded to put her mouth on Edward's neck and began to drink his blood. Once she felt satisfied with herself, Tracy took the knife and threw it into the watery bank and then proceeded to wash her hands and face to remove the blood. She then got back into the car and they drove off, the other woman there claiming that at the time, they could literally smell the blood on her breath. The morning after the horrific stabbing, a jogger was out running near the bank and almost tripped over Edward's lifeless body. The police were quickly notified of it, and when they arrived at the crime scene, they found one of Tracy's bank cards in one of Edward's shoes, which was alongside his neatly folded clothes. Finding the bank card on the victim, the cops quickly located Tracy, who was still with her friends from the night prior, and the cops deemed that there was enough incriminating evidence to arrest the four women and take them in for questioning. A few days after the murder took place, Tracy reportedly told the police that she felt nothing while stabbing Edward, and that she even sat down by him while he was dying to smoke a cigarette and watch him take his final breaths. During the trial, which took place in 1991, Tracy was the only one of the four who pled guilty to the charge of murder. After her confession, a jury convicted Tracy of murder, and she was sentenced to life imprisonment by the Supreme Court of Queensland, with a minimum of 13 years. Lisa Paczynski was also convicted of murder and was sentenced to life in prison, alongside Tracy. Kim Jervis was convicted of manslaughter and was sentenced to 18 years in jail. Tracy Waugh was ultimately cleared and acquitted after the court determined that she had no involvement in the crime. So that was the disturbing and angering case of the lesbian vampire killing. Let me know your thoughts on this case, and if you have any questions or suggestions regarding it, or any other case I've covered, feel free to contact me at roguedarknesspod at gmail.com. You can also reach me directly on Instagram or Twitter at rogue underscore darkness. I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts on cases I've covered, as well as hear any suggestions you may have for future ones you'd like to hear. All the links to the articles referenced in this episode are down below for your reference. As always, if you like what you hear on Rogue Darkness, definitely consider sharing the show with your family and friends, and also by leaving a rating and review on Apple iTunes or any other platform where you can leave a review. Rating, reviewing, subscribing, and sharing are such great ways to help the show out, and to get it more noticed. And as a side note, I do actually have a YouTube channel that I've started up and I'm converting all of my audio recordings into beautiful videos, slowly but surely getting them all out. So definitely check out the link to my YouTube channel down below and don't forget to subscribe. And as I've mentioned, I do have a Ko-fi page set up. So if you ever wanna check it out or to submit a donation to help the show keep going, the link is down below in the description for reference. Any support on there is always greatly appreciated but it's never expected. And with that said, that concludes this week's episode of Rogue Darkness. The darkness is all around us, and I can confidently say that reality truly is more terrifying than fiction. Until next time. 